Jessica came and asked her mother, Mom, what, what's the real reason for uh, Christmas? What's the real meaning of Santa Claus? What's the point? Now, she's at South Downs Elementary, and, and she just came out with that question. What's the point? She's at that stage now where her mind is seeking an explanation for why we do what we do. What, what is the whole purpose? In our play at school, they sang the song, Santa Claus is coming to town. He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you are awake. He knows when you are bad or good, so you better be good for goodness sake, or something like that. You better watch out. You better not pout. You better not cry. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. To town. Now, I know some of y'all say, well, Santa Claus, you don't include that in Christmas. Some people don't want to tell their children about Santa Claus because they figure if you lie about Santa Claus, they might figure you're lying about God. And my thing is, if that's the situation in your house, if your lifestyle can't really lead your children to Christ, then you might not want to introduce them to Santa Claus. But I get a kick out of it. I, I get a kick out of it just holding that up, you know. Uh, you know, what do you want Santa to bring you? What what do you want? And, and she discovered the gifts under the bed, I, I gotta tell you. Uh, and so we had to give her some oatmeal and say, go ahead on and feed the, the reindeers. Put some food out so they can leave you some toys. But uh, Christmas is a, a fun time. It, it reminds me of, of all of the sacrifices that were made. And parents still make a lot of sacrifices for their children for Christmas, buying them gifts and presents. And, and, and all of those things are fine in their place. But, but if we fail to see the real meaning of Christmas, then we, we, we do ourselves a disservice. I believe it's in this chapter, the third chapter of St. John, that we find the real meaning of Christmas. John 3.16 has been called by many as the gospel in a nutshell. It explains why God sent his son. It explains why God was motivated to do something about sinful mankind. In John 3.16, we see the universal character of God's love. But not only the universal character of God's love, we see the sacrificial nature of God's love. But not only the sacrificial nature of God's love, we also see the eternal purpose of God's love. And I want to emphasize each one of these this morning. We want to start off, first of all, with the universal character of God's love. Look in your Bibles in John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world. This is the universal character of God's love. Notice here, God did not say that his love was set on Israel only. Notice here that the word is used for world. The word in the Greek is cosmos. God loved the world. That means he loves not only Jews, but he also loved Gentiles. God so loved the world. Another way of saying, saying this passage, this verse here, is God loved the world so much. And you have to understand that everything God does is motivated by love. A lot of things that you and I do are not motivated by love, but everything God does is motivated by love. His universal character of love is displayed to everyone. And so in loving the world, God did something. Look at the second clause here, it says that he gave his one and only son. The sacrificial nature of God's love led him to do something for the world. 
It wasn't enough for him to love the world. He had to do something in response to the world. And let me explain to you that this word world here doesn't just mean all of the good people. You, you see, we would all figure that God died for me because I'm good. But it's just the opposite. This word world includes everyone. Every person who has fallen short of God's grace, every sinner, everyone who's committed a vile act, everyone who has committed an act of immorality, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Love leads to sacrifice. You can't say I love you without having some sacrifices made. Amen? There must be some sacrifices to demonstrate the love. Now there are a lot of songs that are out on the radio and, and the fellas in the song, they talk about love. And, and I got to distinguish between uh, uh, your generation and my generation. You see, when... Uh, the Temptations wrote and the OJs wrote, they wrote about a whole lot of love. But in the hip hop generation, they don't talk about love. You don't find songs about love in the hip hop generation. But love was talked about in almost every song that came out of Motown. Y'all still remember Motown. The same group, the same band made all of the music and wrote all of the lyrics. They just incorporated Smokey Robinson and all these other people. But they only had one band. And they played on every song that Motown put out. And many of those songs talked about love. Y'all remember the song, My Girl? What can make... Come on, help me out. What can make... What can make me feel this way? My Girl. Okay. Songs that talked about Love talk, talked about the beauty of another person. The, it talked about things that would uh, cause you to want to love the person even more. Remember the other song? She used to be my girl. Huh? These songs reminisce about what you had, but now you don't have it anymore. Motown talked about love, but today P. Diddy and all these other people, they don't talk about love. But even in all of their talking about love, it's not the kind of love God loves us with. See, one of the things I love about Brother Roy is how he laughs. Y'all ever heard him laugh? I mean, he get to laugh and he make you laugh just by him laughing. You love certain things about people and and there are different levels of love. But the highest kind of love there is, is demonstrated by God for us. You see, sometimes uh, we will love people when they're doing what we expect them to do. It's easy to love your children when they obey you. Huh? But when they begin to make up their own mind and when they begin to go their own way, there are certain things you don't love about your children. Amen. And so John, as he writes, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave. His only son. There's another song that has been written. I believe it was written by Tina Turner. She gave up on love. She just said, what's love got to do with it? She don't need all of the roses and all that stuff. She just needs the physical. Because love is only a secondhand emotion, she says. But that kind of love is a self-serving love. It, it's a love that says, give me something that's going to benefit me. But that's not the kind of love God loves us with. 
God is not out seeking to love us in order for us to do right. God loved us even when we didn't have a mind to do right. As a matter of fact, the only reason why you have it on your mind to do right is because of God's grace. You could, there's nothing good about us. And any good that's in us, it comes from God. Any desire in us to do the right thing versus the wrong thing came from God. You know what that's called? That's called grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. See, everything that you and I have is the result of Jesus Christ. And the gift I talked about on last time is still available to everyone because God gave. And if you have Christmas or had it, but you didn't have Jesus, then you still didn't get what God had for you. Amen. Because God's gift is his son. Now, can you think about any other thing that you could give that would be of more value than your child? Can you think of any greater sacrifice to give this is reminiscent of Genesis chapter number 22 when God tells a man by the name of Abram to go and take his son Isaac to mountain Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering now no brother the Quran says that Abram offered Ishmael many of the Muslims believe that the Jews changed the scripture and instead of having uh, Ishmael there they put Isaac Isaac representing Israel and Ishmael representing the Arab people but the Bible is clear that it was Abram who took Isaac on the mountain and had bound him up with a rope had wood for the fire and was about to bring down the knife to kill his son. And while he had the knife drawn, and it's interesting when you read that because Abram has servants because he's a wealthy man, but he tells his servants, y'all stay right here me and the boy, we're going to go to the mountain and worship, and we're going to return back to you. So, so Abraham recognized that if God has made a promise to him, God has to keep his promise. And God cannot keep his promise without me having an heir. And so this heir, whom God told me to sacrifice, God, if I kill him, will raise him back up. That's the faith of Abraham. That's how he became the friend of God. He believed what God said. And so he takes the knife and he's about to bring it down. But then an angel speaks from heaven and says, don't do it. For God knows now that you love him more than you love your son. So you have to imagine here that whatever love there is between a father and a son, it has to be a great love. And it's the same kind of love that God had for his son. But now the difference is. God stopped Abram. From sacrificing Isaac. But there was no one. To stop God. From sacrificing Jesus. At Calvary. As a matter of fact. The sky became dark. 
Jesus stood on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. At 12 noon, it became dark. And all of the sin of the world, my sin and your sin, was placed on Jesus. And the sin being on him for all generations and all centuries of people that have ever lived caused Jesus to cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's believed that during that time of darkness, God could not look upon his son. Because God being holy cannot look upon sin. And sin being placed on the son caused there to be a momentary separation between the father and the son. I tell you, it took some great love. But it says God gave his one and only son. His unique son. Now we're all the sons of God who believe on Jesus Christ. But Jesus is uniquely the son of God. Jesus is both God and man. He's God in a human body. He showed us what God was like. Everything he did, everything he said could be backed up, could be regarded as true because he never told a lie. He never committed an act of wrong. He never sinned. Jesus exemplified for us what God was like and because of that the world hated him now you think God loving the world would cause the world to love God but the world has always hated God because the world loves darkness rather than light the world loves sin The world loves darkness. Jesus represents the light. Jesus represents truth. And some people can't handle the truth. God loved us so he gave his son, his only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the eternal purpose of God's love. Whoever believes on him shall not perish. That's clear. If you believe on Jesus Christ, whom God has given, you will not perish. But have eternal life. You have to open your heart to Jesus Christ. And if you do so, you will not perish, but you will have. Now, this is the present tense here. You will have everlasting life. When does it start? Does everlasting life start when you die? According to John, it begins when you accept Christ. You receive eternal life. That means that you will never die spiritually. Though you might die physically, You will live forever and ever with God. He gave his son so that we shall not perish. But have eternal life. And then it says in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned under sin because of Adam and Eve failure in the garden. Everybody else who came after them were affected and tainted by sin. So the world was already condemned. Jesus did not enter into the world in order to condemn the world. Jesus entered into the world in order to save the world. Everybody ought to know what this means. When you see one of these, now some of y'all can't swim, so y'all might think it's just a flotation device. But at every pool, there is a lifeguard, and he has in his reach one of these. 
every boat that goes out on the Gulf ought to have one of these. And when you see somebody that's drowning, this needs to go out. He wants to rescue us. Jesus is the life raft. Jesus is God's way of letting us know that we can be saved. We don't have to continue in sin. We can be forgiven. We can be restored back to a relationship with God. We can know God.